Support for Central Florida Public Media comes from JustCallMo.com and attorney Mo DeWitt, proud presenter of WMFE's Engage program. Mo DeWitt is committed to offering legal guidance in personal injury cases such as car accidents and slip and falls. Offices in Orlando. More at JustCallMo.com. Welcome to Engage, leading conversations that matter. Engage is made possible with support from inaugural sponsor, JustCallMo.com, and the support of listeners like you. You're listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. I'm Sharon Stone. Coming up, we look at efforts to incorporate esports into Florida's scholastic athletic programming. And Orlando's minor league hockey team is angling for the ECHL championship. We'll talk about the team's progress in the playoffs. But first, another delay for Boeing's first crewed launch. Two NASA astronauts remain on the ground after a launch attempt of Boeing's Starliner spacecraft to the International Space Station was called off last night. Yeah, Roger. uh, So the engineering team has evaluated um, the vehicle is not uh, in a configuration where we can proceed with uh, flight today. So uh, we're going to initiate uh, our scrub and recycle operation. An issue with the capsule's rocket is to blame here. Our assistant news director and host of Are We There Yet? podcast, Brendan Byrne, is here to explain what happened and what happens next. So before we talk about the bigger issues here, Brendan, help us understand exactly what caused this scrub. Sure. Um, Well, engineers are trying to figure that out right now. Um, They're investigating some strange sounds that they heard as NASA astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore were making their way up the launch tower and into their capsule. Over the comms loops, we could hear ground crews reporting a chattering coming from the rocket. And just as Wilmore and Williams were being strapped in for launch, United Launch Alliance called off the attempt due to a valve issue on the upper stage of the Atlas V rocket. So at a press conference last night, ULA CEO Tori Bruno explained the valve is used to regulate the pressure in the rocket's upper stage, which is called the Centaur. In some cases, these pressure valves can open and shut rapidly. It was described as like the valve that you have on your hot water heater in case there too much pressure builds up. It kind of opens and closes like that. And when it does that, it creates this chattering or it's also been described as a buzzing sound. So the team's now combing through the data of sensors near the valve to see just how many times the valve moved. If engineers determine it's within its limits, which is about 200,000 times of going open and closed, they can quickly turn around and and try to launch again. But if the valve needs replacing, if it's gone over that 200,000 buzzes or chatters, the valve's going to need to be replaced, which could delay the launch even further. Here's here's United Launch Alliance CEO Tori Bruno explaining what's next. We have spare valves. We know how to do it. We've done it before, but it would take several days. And so we would coordinate with the range and with, uh, you know, with our partners at NASA and at Boeing, and then we'd have a date for you, you know, pretty soon. But I I can't tell you that right now because we're still looking at the data. Now, with that said, the company said the next launch opportunity from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station will be no earlier than Friday, May 10th. But if there has to be a replacement of that valve, we're looking at next week at the earliest. Okay, so, Brendan, from an outsider looking in, this scrub just seems like a setback. Tell me why NASA and Boeing are saying otherwise. They use this as an opportunity to really test and do a run through of the launch sequence. So this entire process, as they were investigating this kind of buzzing sound, they were still continuing with the launch. So the scrub was called about two hours before T minus zero. But at that time, they've got some really good work done. They strapped both Butch and Sonny into their seats. They were actually ahead of schedule. They were learning us some issues with the communications between the astronauts and mission control. So all in all, it was almost like a a dress rehearsal uh, for the real thing. They got to test a lot of these things. So NASA Associate Administrator Ken Bowersox said last night that, you know, they're looking at this as something quite positive. All I want to say first is that good things are worth waiting for, and uh, and we'll get a chance to, to see that uh, rocket and spacecraft lift off the pad here soon. Um, it was really impressive to watch the launch team uh, as the issue popped up. Uh, the count had been going very smoothly, and, uh, and, and they spotted the issue. They followed their flight rules and made the decision to scrub so that they could do some more troubleshooting and decide what we were going to do next. 
Okay, so Brendan, if SpaceX launched its first human crew in 2020, what is Boeing's role in commercial spaceflight moving forward? Boeing has always been a part of this program. This is part of NASA's commercial crew program, right? This was stood up in after 2011's retirement of the space shuttle program. NASA needed a way to get astronauts to and from the space station using U.S. partners. So in 2014, both Boeing and NASA received these contracts to design, develop, and build these capsules. Once this Starliner capsule does launch, they're able to certify this vehicle for future missions, and then it will go into crew rotations. You mentioned SpaceX launched its first human crew in 2020. Since then, there have been eight operational missions back and forth, with SpaceX doing all of these missions about every six months to the space station. Once Starliner is certified, they're going to go ahead and split those rotations. So it'll be SpaceX, Boeing, SpaceX, Mm -hmm. Boeing. And this is important because NASA really wants to have redundancy built into the system. If something happens with one of the capsules, they're going to be back where they were when the space shuttle retired. They have no way up there. So that is why they want to have two of these capsules operating so that we have continued access to space and continued access to the International Space Station for U.S. astronauts. Okay, so they don't have a backup. This is the backup. Yeah, (laughs) this is the backup. When I think about Boeing, I cannot help but think about the issues that they've had with their airplanes. Are there any safety concerns with Boeing trying to enter this whole commercial crew world? There have been safety concerns. There have been issues throughout this entire program. You mentioned SpaceX launched its first human crew in 2020. Boeing launched an uncrewed mission in 2019. This was part of the certification process. That mission failed to reach the space station, largely in part due to an issue with the software that was written and some management issues between how the software developers talked to one another. Boeing had to redo that mission. They paid for that mission on their own dime. It did get to the space station in 2022 without a crew. But more issues popped up, right? They found some issues with the valve that controlled the steering of the capsule. So they fixed those. And then last year, more issues were found as they were finalizing the certification for this flight. They found some issues with the cabling on the parachutes. They also found some issues with the tape that was used to control some of the internal wiring. It turned out to be very flammable, not a good thing for a spacecraft. So they had to go ahead and fix that. So, you know, Boeing says... There are no kind of tie-ins between what's happening with its airliner division and spacecraft division, but it's hard to not see this kind of looming shadow of Boeing at large over both of these programs. NASA is confident and has expressed that confidence in Boeing by certifying this flight last month, and they said that they've done their due diligence, and that's why there are these tests, is to find these things here. So NASA has confidence in it, and Boeing has confidence as well. We'll see. I'm curious about the actual astronauts, you know, we're covering it from a distance or watching what happens. They're living it. They're waiting literally years for this launch. Have they ever spoken about what this whole process has been like for them? Butch and Sonny are both naval test pilots. They are both seasoned NASA astronauts, have flown on space shuttle, have flown on Russia's Soyuz capsule, have lived and worked on the International Space Station. They have spoken about this particular mission, a brand new flight of a brand new spacecraft, they are the first two that get to fly it. It is such an incredible opportunity and great responsibility for both of them. They're very happy to be on this. Sonny was actually scheduled to be on the first operational mission and was moved to this one and was really, really excited to hear that. They know that there are delays. Space shuttle was delayed. You know, Soyuz capsule launches are delayed. They are at the astronaut crew quarantine facility at the Kennedy Space Center. I've talked to many, many astronauts before. They say it's very comfortable there. Most importantly, they're very well fed. <laughs> they have their own chefs and they love the food there. So Butch and Sonny have said that they're being taken care of, but they're willing to wait. And they know that this is a learning process and they know that there will be these setbacks in here because that's all part of the program. They are testing this vehicle to make sure it is perfect for future crew members that will follow after them. Okay, then we'll wait, too. That's our assistant news director and host of Are We There Yet? podcast, Brendan Byrne. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Ahead on Engage, we'll look at the rise of 
eSports in high schools. And later, we'll chart the Orlando Solar Bears as they trundle through this year's Kelly Cup playoffs. I'm Sharon Stone. You're listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. You are listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. I'm Sharon Stone. Ahead on this program, a physician specializing in eSports talks about his own kid's experience with video gaming. There was one point, you know, when they were a little younger, they got into Fortnite and um, they would just play, you know, for hours and it would change their personalities, you know, and they, they got very angry. We'll look at how long-term video gaming can affect both physical and mental health. Right now, though, competitive video gaming could become an officially sanctioned high school sport in this state. The Florida High School Athletic Association recently held discussions about adding electronic sports, known as esports. The FHSAA is the nonprofit governing body that oversees and regulates high school sports in public schools. Scott Jamison is the Associate Executive Director for Athletic Services. He joined Engage to talk about what a competition would even look like. He started the conversation by explaining what prompted the FHSAA to even consider esports as an official high school sport. We may be able to get some involvement from some students who maybe don't play traditional sports, but could be involved in this and get them involved in something. Obviously, the highest dropout prevention that there is is athletics and extracurricular activities and being involved in a team. And so this is something that maybe they they thought would help us reach out to a different group of students. So it started there. We did some research. We had about 400 and something schools respond. More than half are either already doing esports at their school in in some sort of capacity, whether it's a club or competitively with their county. And uh, the rest of that said that they would absolutely be interested. We have other counties that are starting it up this year. So where are you in the process in terms of what questions are you asking within FHSAA about adding esports potentially? Sure. So in our policies, uh, our policy handbook, the next step that we're taking as requested by our board of directors is to reach out to schools and get official letters of interest or participation from our schools. So we'll get letters and they'll tell us, hey, we're already participating or we're very interested. We will offer a team. And we have two different thresholds for sports. We have a recognized sport of which we have none right now. That would take 10 percent of our member high schools, senior high schools offering a sport in at least two of our sections. We have the state broken down into four sections. So we have to have at least two sections offering a sport with at least 10% for uh, being recognized. Recognized meaning that we're saying the sport is growing, it's building. There's no state championship offered yet, but it is a sport that the FHSAA is monitoring. There is eligibility that they can go do for it. They can put their student athletes in on home campus, which is our eligibility platform. And then we have a sanctioned sport which requires 20% of the senior high schools in at least two sections offering the sport. And a sanctioned sport is what all the rest of our sports are and that we would actually host a state championship. We'd give state championship medals and trophies and it would be treated the same as any of our other sports, football, basketball, baseball, softball, be treated just like those. So it's not a super quick process, although it can be as quick as the board would like it to be. It's it's their determination on that, but we'll provide the information and they'll determine which direction we go. Are we talking months, weeks, or years to move forward? It could be years. When beach volleyball was added, it took a few years before beach volleyball was added. Girls wrestling was also one of our more recent. They are super fast-growing sports, but it does take time. Again, it could be something that's that's sort of moved a little bit quicker. I would not anticipate that it would be offered next year. Again, this is if it goes through the approval process. Maybe the 25-26 the or 26-27 is probably more realistic. We just started a two-year classification cycle. So they may choose to wait through that. They may choose to fast track it. I would say it's probably at least a year. But again, I I couldn't put any sort of timetable on it. Just, um, you know, we'll have to see where we land in terms of letters that we get from schools and feedback that we get from schools. What would the response be to people wondering why you're even, even considering it in terms of they're saying this isn't even a sport? So I guess there's a couple trains of thought on that. If you look at certain countries out there, it is the largest spectator and they call it a sport that there there is in certain countries. It's it's growing. We have colleges that are offering scholarships for it. And, you know, that'll be up to our board to determine whether or not they view it in the same vein. Um, We have there states like Georgia that offer it as a sanctioned sport. There's many states in the country that are offering it. So the precedent has been kind of set that 
you know, we're, we're in a different time now. Video games are something that are very commonplace. Kids are playing video games all the time. You know, I guess the thought process is why not, again, try to get them involved in something that that we know is the best dropout prevention. Playing an, an organized sport at the high school level is what keeps kids above a 2.0. It helps kids graduate. So why not reach out to another group of students and involve them and get them involved in something in a team aspect if they're already doing it and, they're, and, they're, and they are already doing it at a, at a very high rate. So uh, I think that's some of the thought process with it. And whether it's a sport or not, it's not for me to determine. Um, whether chess is a sport or not is not for me to determine. That's another one. Bass fishing is another one that's offered across the country in, in certain states. Some people would say that's not a sport. So, you know, I think that it's that, that that's in the eye of the beholder. And and so it's something we're, we're doing our due diligence on and we're going to bring every bit of information that our board wants us to bring. And, and then they'll make that final determination. When you add a new sport, does that take away or impact resources that you have within FHSAA to the other sports? It would not. One of the determinations we'll have to make is, will it be a fall sport, a winter sport, or a spring sport? So we'll have to evaluate that. Uh, the one good thing with esports is they don't need field time or court time. That's that's one of the typically the determining factors we have to make is are they sharing a court or a field? Do we need to spread it out to a different season? Are they going to be you know fighting for that time, for lack of a better term? But in this case, we don't have to. So it's it's kind of going to be up to um, feedback that we get and and looking at what other states do and how they balance that out. But no, it, it would not take, you know, we, we would fit it in and one of our administrators would run it and, and we would operate. Uh, it, it There won't be as much, even at the school level. Again, you're not having to rent out the gym. You're not having to do that kind of stuff. I think, he's, you know, the, the equipment that they'll have to have and a lot of it, the kids will already have. So I don't know that it'll be a ton of resources on the schools either. And, and again, they, they can make that determination whether they want to do it, how deep into it they want to go, what type of equipment they want to get. So I think it'll be really something that... Uh, is not going to be a huge stretch for us to be able to do if the board would like us to. Understood. For someone who has no idea what esports are, are we talking about students playing games that are uh, hockey or basketball, football, video games, or are these more games maybe putting some type of puzzle together? Great question. So I think the direction right now that a lot of states have gone and what our board is to actually not do sports related games because it may end up capturing the students that are already playing sports. A high percentage of student athletes do play sports related games. So right now, Rocket League, which is essentially, um, I guess the way to describe it is soccer with cars when they hit a ball around and go and, and then uh, Mario Kart, um, League of Legends. Those are some those are probably the and then. Um, Super Smash Bros. Those are the four that tend to be the most popular. So those are kind of the four that we're looking at. How many we'll offer, we're not sure, but those are the four that have come up numerous times that other states are implementing that, again, we feel like would possibly dip into a different group of students at the schools as opposed to just having the football or basketball players play in Madden or NBA 2K. Scott Jamison is the Associate Executive Director for Athletic Services for the Florida High School Athletic Association. After the break, we'll talk about the health and safety of esports participants and the impacts of prolonged gaming on developing adolescents. Video gaming at the recreational level can result in an inappropriate amount of time sitting, sedentary, staring at a video monitor, pounding out repetitive movements on a controller. At the competitive level, participants can spend up to 16 hours a day in training. Our next guest specializes in addressing the physical stress caused by prolonged gaming, Todd Sontag is a physician with Orlando Health Physician Associates Zavito. A few years ago, he was the official team doctor for the Orlando Magic's official NBA 2K team. Yes, the NBA has licensed esports affiliates. Those players incur a lot of injuries. Here's Dr. Sontag to explain how video gamers get hurt. There's typically going to be a lot of orthopedic based injuries, you know, and it's it's usually due to repetitive use, like overuse things. A lot of times they'll get a tendonitis of the tendons that go to their thumb, you know, just because of their chronic use of their controllers. Carpal tunnel is another big one that gamers get. After that, I mean, those are going to be your two main ones. There can also be some elbow issues, but a lot of it's going to come from posture related things and neck pain and eye strain. And a lot of these things are going to come from just the hours that the esports athletes have to put in, you know, to be able to compete at those levels. 
What kind of hours do these players put in? I wonder if people think of, you know, pro gamers as someone like who would be playing at home recreationally. Right. So a lot of these gamers, it is a full time job. And so they'll be training for, you know, usually eight to 10, you know, sometimes more hours every day. You know, they'll, they'll have morning sessions and break for lunch and have afternoon sessions. And so it, it really is, you know, a lot of intense work. And so what we really always try to push is prevention of these injuries, right? You know, it's a lot better to try and prevent these things than to treat them. And so one of the things that has been shown to be vital is their core strength, you know, just like with everything else. They got to put in the time to strengthen their core. They got to put in the time to strengthen their muscles. They have to make sure they're taking breaks when they're gaming for hours on end. And not only that, but they got to make sure their gaming station is ergonomically correct. If their angles, you know, where their eyes are supposed to be are too high or too low, it's going to cause neck issues. And the way the body works is every time you change something, your body changes down the road. So if your neck changes its angle, well, then your back's going to change, you know, lower down to compensate. And so one little thing can lead to exponential other issues in other parts of your body. And so really the most important thing is make sure that physically you're in good shape. I know people always talk about are esports athletes really athletes, but if they truly take care of their body, it's going to help them in their sport, just helping with their eye hand coordination because any injury is going to affect their ability to play at the level that they want to play. You know, if they're suffering from carpal tunnel or tendonitis, their reaction time won't be as good. And in that high level of competition, if your reaction time is a split second slower, that could be the difference between, you know, winning and losing. But doing the core strengthening, working on your posture, these truly are, you know, such important parts of esports athletes' life. So this is just a different level than someone playing at home. It's like the difference between someone driving down the street and a NASCAR driver doing this as a profession. Correct. Yeah, it's a, that's a great analogy. The typical gamer, I mean, a recreational gamer, I mean, I never played for hours on end. You know, I'd play, you know, Pac-Man or Super Mario. I guess I'm aging myself, but, you know, you play for a little while and then you just stop. But... Today's gamers, it's not just about gaming. It's also their social, you know? And so they're they're talking with their friends as they're playing. Like, you know, people talk about how this generation just isn't as social, but they really are. It's just in a different way. But when they're playing, you know, socially, they're not as intense. You know, they're sitting on beanbag chairs, like, you know, they're just having fun. But the ones that are truly like the esports athletes for mm-hmm. these major organizations... Yeah, I mean, that's, this is a business. It's a million, multi-million dollar business. And so companies and teams are investing a lot of money into these guys. So it is important for them, just like NASCAR drivers, not just driving, right? It's really making sure your body's in tip-top shape to be able to, you know, have that split second of an advantage. So the injuries that you've dealt with, what can the impact be on younger bodies on adolescents. You know, and adolescents, I mean, it's you, that's a tough one because today's generation, we start babysitting our kids with iPads early on. And so they get this addiction, you know, to electronics and games and everything. And so it reaches a point when they're in the adolescence, they, they are heavily involved in gaming. I mean, I, I always limited my, in my kids' involvement, especially during the week, There was one point, you know, when they were a little younger, they got into Fortnite and um, they would just play, you know, for hours and it would change their personalities, you know, and they, they got very angry. And so I took it away from them during the week and I allowed them one hour per day on the weekends and they became kids again. You know, they didn't have all that angst in them. And they stopped playing. They lost interest and they started doing other stuff and they stopped playing. You know, I think there's value in it. Um, I think there's value in gaming socially. 
even they say today's surgeons that grew up gaming because of their eye hand coordination, those are tend to be some of the best surgeons. So I think there's value in it, but just like anything else, too much of a good thing, it can be a bad thing. Hearing you talk about the impact on your kids makes me wonder if, as a doctor, did you ever have to be aware of the mental health impact on these athletes? Huge, huge. A lot of stress, right? You go from being in your bedroom, you know, gaming in your own house, to now you're performing in arenas, being streamed on YouTube and Twitch. And now you're really out there and people are watching. And so just like every other professional, you do start getting the critics and the haters that are going to try and bring you down. You know, and that added stress is something that these kids are 18, 19, 20 years old. They've never had to deal with that level. So it is important. Mental health is, is such an important component. So I think it's just, you know, a good esports team, whoever's in charge of it, really needs to be well of where his players are. Another issue I wanted to ask you about was actually the use of drugs in the esports community. We're talking about like Adderall and Ritalin being popular. Is there mm -hmm. any kind of testing that exists for it? Is that something that you had to be aware of with the e-athletes you worked with? When I worked with it, you know, it wasn't something that was being tested for. I'm not sure if, if that's a banned substance now. Because I know it, like in a lot of professional sports, these are things that can help you hyper-focus. And they're not illegal drugs, but are they used incorrectly? Are they obtaining it incorrectly? Do they really have these diagnoses? You know, that's not something I saw with the players I had. Looking back, none of my players actually were, were on those. We didn't check to see if they were getting it elsewhere, you know, which is a common thing in all kids that age right now, you know, in school. But it wasn't really a factor that we took into consideration when I was doing it. You mentioned just how important prevention is for the athletes. And we're more familiar with the, you know, the intense physical training that some pro athletes would do physically. So what does it look like for someone who is a competitive gamer? How do you work on prevention with them? So the strengthening of the core is so important is what they need to work on, which is not just but people think core is your, you know, your abs. It's not, it's, it's also your back and you really have to concentrate on maintaining, you know, a strong core, but then your, your ergonomics of your workstation is also what contributes. You know, if you set yourself up to succeed, you know, with a strong core, but then your workstation, your gaming station puts you in a situation where it puts strain on parts of your body, regardless of how you've done, you're still setting yourself up to fail. And so there are things you could do. You got to make sure your feet are flat. You got to make sure your screen, you know, is eye level, should be in the middle of your screen. You should use your armrest to relax those muscles instead of holding the controller up to engage it. The controller should be at elbow height. There's all these things you can do to help prevent those injuries. So taking care of your body, you know, super important, as well as nutrition. You want to put your body in the best position possible to be successful. So strengthening your core, working on nutrition, and then your proper gaming station, you know, and listen to your body. If you start to have an issue, and it's hard for at that age, but if you start to have an issue, they need to know that they can fix it. A lot of them are so afraid to, to speak up because they don't want to lose their spot, you know? And in a game where split seconds mean so much, they don't want to have to take any chances. And so the problem is they start to get little warning signs. Oh, my elbow is like a little tender. You know, it wasn't like that before. Instead of saying something, they deal with it because it's just a little bit. Sometimes these injuries end up needing surgery, you know, if they can't be fixed with conservative treatment. And a lot of times, just because it's a little injury doesn't mean you can't play. You just have to take measures to fix it before it becomes a major injury. So is there a too young to be playing video games from a physical health perspective? Is there a negative impact on a certain age group? I think as long as the game is age appropriate and you limit 
the amount of time, I don't, don't see a problem with gaming. I just don't think it should be used as a babysitter. And, you know, you don't want to let your kids just sit there and just be glued in because it does change them. You got to get them outside, get them on their bikes, get them, you know, shooting hoops. Dr. Todd Sontag is a physician with Orlando Health Physician Associates Oviedo. Coming up, the Orlando Solar Bears are making a run at the ECHL Championship. We'll learn about their chances of bringing the Kelly Cup to the Kia Center. We want to hear from you. Send us an email to engage at cfpublic.org. You are listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. You're listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. I'm Sharon Stone. Well, it's playoff season, and we saw the Orlando Magic eliminated in a Game 7 loss in Cleveland on Sunday. Orlando's NBA team season is over, but the city's ECHL professional hockey team is still in the hunt in their postseason. The Orlando Solar Bears are down two games in this best-of-seven game series with the Florida Everblades in the second round of the Kelly Cup playoffs. Game 3 is tonight at the Kia Center in Orlando. Joey Potato is the voice of the Orlando Solar Bears. He joined Engage to talk about the rise of hockey in Florida. And I started the conversation by asking Botano how the Solar Bears are feeling after pulling off an upset to make it to the second round of the playoffs. At this moment, you know, we're down two games to none to Florida. But it's certainly the uh, the first round series was uh, was pretty awesome. The crowds were great. The format of the series was 2-3-2, two, two, which meant the first two games were in Greenville and then the next three were in Orlando. So. When we split the first two games in Greenville, we came home with an opportunity to win the series. And we didn't do that. We won two out of three at home, but it certainly put us in a good position to go back to Greenville and win game number six. So in this round against Florida, it's a little different. We lost both games on the road to start the series, but now we have three games coming up at home in Orlando where we hope uh, we win all three games and, and head back to Estero with an opportunity to close out the series. Can you talk to me more about just being on home ice? Does that make a difference? Do you have a passionate fan base? Oh, absolutely. You know, we, we're consistently in the top five in the league in attendance. Obviously, we are in a bigger market. You know, our league being the ECHL, there's some smaller markets in our league, but certainly Orlando uh, is one of the bigger markets, and we and we draw very well for our league. And we're right now we're second in the league in attendance in the playoffs, just behind Toledo, Ohio. So we have a great fan base here. The guys really enjoy playing here at Kia Center. They feed off the fans. And um, we need the fans to bring that energy again this round because not only, you know, are we down to nothing, so we need that energy, but also, you know, Florida's our, our big rival. And so uh, there's there's no love lost between these two teams and certainly uh, the fan bases as well. So it, I'm, I'm really looking forward to these two games for sure. Hopefully a, a third game, a game five in Orlando as well uh, on Saturday night. So the Everblades, that's a rivalry game for you. What's What difference does it make to be playing a rival? Uh, there's just a lot of intensity in the games. The games have that different atmosphere to it. Like the air is a little thicker in the building. It's just, uh, it's, it's just a different environment when you're going up against a, a team that you have that not only geographical rivalry, but also just over the years, you know, the, the Everblades have kind of had our number there. This is the fifth time these two teams have met in the playoffs and Florida's won the first four series. So for Orlando, it's it's been a, a mountain they've been unable to climb there in their team's history, and obviously trying to do that this year against a team that's the back-to-back -back defending Kelly Cup champions. So they've won the championship in each of the last two years. So that makes it all the more difficult. But I think this team like has handled a lot of adversity throughout the year. Uh, we beat the number one seed in the South Division to get to this point. So um, I, I this I, I like our chances up against anybody in this league. And even though we are down 0-2 right now to Florida, I, I still think with these next three games being at home, you know, there's still a great opportunity to win this series. And even just getting to this point into the playoffs, it sounds like you had a really dramatic entrance. You got into the playoffs on the last day of the regular season. Is that right? In the last minute Oof. of the last game of the regular season in game 72. So 
it was a tie game in in our game. It, it's it's it, there's a lot of moving parts here, but I'll try to keep it as short as possible. South Carolina was playing Florida. If South Carolina would have won the game in regulation, we would have been eliminated from playoff contention. So what happened in their game was with about six minutes to go, they scored to take the lead. In our game, there was about a minute and a half left, and we were in a 0-0 score. So we actually had to pull our goalie for an extra skater in a tie game to try to score a goal, and we actually did. We scored a goal with 27 seconds left in the game because we won in regulation time. That eliminated South Carolina, and oddly enough, you don't know what you don't know, but Florida actually came back and beat South Carolina in that game. So technically, we wouldn't have needed to pull the goalie, but we didn't know that at the time. We thought we needed to win. So it all worked out in the end for us, but uh, it was certainly a, a stressful time. And, and just having to go through that process just to get in, I think it makes this team hard to count out in, in any circumstance. So we're talking to you with the Orlando Solar Bears. They are affiliated with the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Lightning were eliminated by the Florida Panthers in the NHL playoffs. We're just talking about all these Florida teams. Is the Sunshine State a bit of a successful place to play hockey? Is this a destination in a way? I would say now. You got great weather here. I mean, I'm originally from Michigan, and I moved down here for for this job because, uh, one, I, I – think the Orlando Solar Bears are a first class organization but two I think if you're going to work in hockey uh, why wouldn't you choose a, a southern state or a western state that that you know you can come to the rink wearing shorts uh, for most of the season so that that was certainly weighed into my decision to come down here it's it's a it's a great place to live it's a great place to play hockey and the fans are great here they they really uh, they they support the team and I think the NHL coming here in the early 90s, first to Tampa and then to Sunrise, it really kind of set the table for what we have here today. A player that just signed yesterday with the New Jersey Devils, uh, Seamus Casey, played in the Florida Everblades youth hockey organization growing up as a, a native of Fort Myers. So every year, more and more NHL players get churned out of the state of Florida and it's kind of like Arizona was in the in the 90s. You had Austin Matthews, one of the top NHL players in the league right now, playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. He's from Arizona. You're going to start to see that now with, with the state of Florida as well, where more and more players are coming out of this state because of the foundation that was laid by the Lightning, by the Panthers in their communities because they, they immediately went to work on the grassroots side of the game and growing the game, not only in their big cities, but also in the smaller communities that surround uh, their cities. And I think that's what makes the affiliation between Tampa Bay and the NHL and, and the Orlando Solar Bears and the ECHL. There's, you know, there's only, it's only a two hour time travel via car between the two. The one's a coastal, but you know, central Florida, it's not that far away you know, a lot of our fans are Tampa Bay Lightning fans and, and vice versa. So it, it makes that connection all the more easier. And it's it's been a great affiliation. And then on the flip side, since we're just talking about hockey in Florida in general, the Florida Panthers ECHL affiliate is these Florida Everblades. So that you know also helps grow the game to have hockey being prevalent in, in Estero, Fort Myers and Naples, that area of uh, Florida as well. What is your message to our audience and to, you know, your fans out there? Well, right now, uh, you know, at this time of the year, if you haven't been to a Solar Bear game before, or maybe you, you haven't been in a few years, or maybe you're one of those fans that was here in the, in the mid-90s with the IHL team and, and you haven't come back since the ECHL has been here, this would be a great time to, to take in a Solar Bears game. You know, there's obviously there's the product on the ice, which you could argue in the playoffs has never been better. This is the best time to watch a hockey game. But even if you're not a hockey fan, you know, there's plenty of entertainment and fun for the kids and for the family uh, to, to come out and, and have a great time. It's a relatively affordable endeavor being that this is uh, the minor leagues in the ECHL. And so um, I, I would say this would be a great opportunity to give us a chance. And while you're here, you know, if you go to a playoff game, you enjoy it. Of course, we have, uh, you know, season ticket opportunities for next season coming up already. So um, I would definitely implore all of the listeners to 
if you haven't come out to definitely give us a shot and if you have come out thank you for your your uh thank you for your uh, you know patronage at our games and, and we look forward to having you again and and this is the time you know we're the our playoff slogan is the time is now so no better time uh for the fans to come out and, and watch a game than right now Joey Botano is the voice of the Orlando Solar Bears. If you want to cheer on the team, tickets are still available for tonight's 7 p.m. playoff game at the Kia Center. That's all for today's edition of Engage. We are back Thursday at 3 p.m. If you miss any part of the show today, you can always subscribe to the Engage podcast and listen when it's convenient for you. The program will be available on demand at cfpublic.org. I'm Sharon Stone. Thank you for joining us. All Things Considered with Nicole darden Creston is up next on Central Florida Public Media following NPR News.